chapter 9. And we're going to look, we're actually going to read most of the chapter here, but we're going to read one verse here, and it's going to be verse 1. All right, amen. It's good to be saved. It's good to be in church. Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. And he, that he is our Lord and Savior Jesus, entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. All right, let's pray. Father, again, it is good to be saved and it's good to be in church. And Lord, just thank you for bringing everyone to church nice and safe, Lord. It's good that we can come into your house and worship you, Lord. We love you. Thank you. We ask you to bless the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, there's a lot of things going on here in Matthew chapter 9. Uh, you have the call of the author of the book, Matthew himself, in verse 9. Uh, you have the parables of the garment and the bottles in verses 16 and 17. Uh, this is Jesus' uh, third trip to Galilee. Uh, this is where he was brought up and lived. And he looked upon his people here as sheep without a shepherd uh, being scattered abroad. But also in this chapter, you're going to see five people that we're going to look at uh, in this chapter. Uh, they're nameless. Uh, they're really overlooked. And if you read chapter 9, you'll see some great important events and miracles taking place here in these people's lives. And, you know, Jesus was a people person. Uh, he liked to talk to people. He liked to heal people, touch people, have dialogue with them. All right? He knew what was going on. You know why? Because Jesus is God. Right? He knows what you're thinking and how you're feeling. He knows. And that brings us to understand what serious problems Jesus is looking at uh, in his day and what he had to, you know, what he had to deal with and how he dealt with it. And he'll expect us uh, down the road uh, to follow his example and to uh, act and, and do the things that even that Jesus did. And right? now these five people had five different problems. And that Jesus was able to take care of each and every one. And I don't know what kind of problems uh, you guys might have, because we all have problems. I have problems. All right, but I can tell you that Jesus Christ can take care of every one of your problems. Guaranteed. In fact, in uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And especially if the problems that people have are spiritual problems. Right? Most of the problems in life are spiritual. Many of these start with the heart and they manifest itself uh, to the physical. So let's take a look here and let's run these five people through. Let's take a look at their problems and let's see how Jesus dealt with them. And what I'd like to do is that I want to make the connection uh, between the five people. Some are going to be related to us. Uh, a lot of them are going to be related to lost people and the world. And what had happened those thousands of years ago are just as applicable as today. All right. Now we have here the first man. He has the palsy. Uh, this is in verses 1 to 8. All right. Verse 1, he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. Behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore uh, think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easy to say, Thy sons be forgiven thee, or say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then say he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given uh, such power unto men. Now what is the palsy? All right. Now the palsy is a loss of muscle control. All right. In modern times, we call it CP, or cerebral palsy. In fact, we have a cerebral palsy center in uh, Roosevelt here. And this refers to a group, of, uh, a group of neurological disorders that appear in infancy or early childhood and permanently affect body movement. It affects muscle coordination and balance. CP affects the part of the brain that controls muscle movement. 
right? He couldn't control his muscles anymore. You notice they brought him lying in a bed. He couldn't move. He couldn't control his muscles. What's the first thing Jesus did here? In verse 2. Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Wouldn't you think maybe the first thing he'd just do is go, all right, get up and, you know, go dance, go walk? No, that's interesting. What Jesus did here is that he dealt with the man's spiritual problems first, not the physical. <clears throat> he forgave his sins. Isn't that interesting? It's like a lot of people today. They have spiritual palsy. They have no control of their bodies. Their bodies have no feelings to sin as sin ravages their bodies. Whether it be smoking, doing drugs, drinking, partying, lack of sleep, these types of behavior put people in an early grave. Right? The man with the palsy is a type or a picture of a lost person. All right. Again, verse 2, they brought him to Jesus, a man sick with the palsy. What's, the, what's our connection to this? What's the Christian's connection? They, we are the they. They brought the man in a bed to Jesus. And we are to take our lost friends, our last lost family members, and they are spiritually have spiritual palsy, and we are to bring them to the Lord. So what? So that their sins may be forgiven, just like our sins have been forgiven. All right? Our sins have been forgiven. The difference between us and a lost person is that we're all sinners. Our sins have been forgiven because we've asked the Lord. All right? That's the connection here. All right? The they are us. The sick man's friends are a type of what us Christians, what, of what we should be doing. We need to bring the lost to the Lord Jesus Christ and let Jesus forgive them of their sins and to heal them. All right? You notice Jesus not a priest forgave the man's sins. All right? You know, you have one church down, you know, down the road that it's the priest, you know, it's, you know, yabba dabba do and your sins are forgiven. Uh, I can't forgive you of your sins. All right? I'm just a pastor. I teach the Bible. It is the Lord Jesus. It is God only that can forgive sins. And you notice Jesus healed the man here. Now, there's a little bit of controversy in Christendom. How many people have ever watched a, a tele-evangelist, you know? And you see all the people with the canes and, you know, the wheelchairs and, and uh, you know, the TV preacher just goes, and the, the guy goes, woo! And, it, and, he's, and he's, well, and then they've done some studies that some of this stuff is a carnival act. Now, I believe that some people have the gift of healing, but it's God using that person. And I'd be very careful. Right? It's the Lord that forgives. It is the Lord that can heal the man. All right? Listen, uh, you know what I would do? If I knew someone had the gift of healing, you know what I would do? I'd say, come on, bud, we're going to South Nass Nassau Hospital, and I want you to heal everyone in the hospital. If, you know what? That, that's the truth. Instead of bringing them to you go to the hospital and heal them. All right? But it's our job here is to bring our lost friends to the Lord and let the Lord heal and forgive the man of his sins. All right, the second problem we have here, look at verses uh, 18 and 19. We have Jairus' uh, daughter is raised from the dead. All right? Second person here, look at verse 18. And while he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is now even dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Jairus was a ruler in the synagogue. Right? He was in temple. He was in church all the time. He was an active member. He was a, a ruler. But he had a daughter that was sick and had died. All right? And what's our connection here? How many parents? All right? We have a lot of older people here. How many parents we have in church every week? They're active. They're faithful. They're rulers. All right? They're in church every week but they have kids that are spiritually sick, spiritually dead. You older people come to church, but where's your kids? All right? All right? Many of our church kids now resent going to church. All right? The modern, the modern society says church is boring. 
All right? And when the kid turns 16, 17, 18, they tell their parents, hey, I ain't going to church no more. All right? They don't want to go to church anymore. They're not interested in the things of God. And they are dying a slow death spiritually, on the, and they're on their way to hell. They'll spend, uh, you know, 10 hours a day on the internet and the cell phone and they'll text 10,000 times and, and they'll, you know, they'll go on, a, you know, the YouTube and all that. But they say, hey, let's go to church. It's like, no, I'm not going to church. One hour. Free pizza, free soda. I mean, we'll, we, we even pay. <laughs> and then, I ain't going to church. Now, some of your older parents, you know, you know how... You know how it was back in the old days. It wasn't like today where we try to like reason with our kids like, hey Johnny, if you, if you come to church, we'll go to McDonald's and I'll get you a Happy Meal after church and I'll get you a Friendly's ice cream and I'll take you to Toys R Us. And, and back in the old days, we're going to church. And if you said no, it was what? The bell came out. <laughs> you're going to go to church. In fact, you're going to love the pain of abuse because your butt's hurting. <laughs> You, you didn't reason with your dad 50 years ago. You, all right, you're lucky he said three words, get in the car. Okay, dad, and that was it. But what's happening today is we have a modern society and we have a generation of kids, and I'm not beating up on the kids, believe me, a lot of, sometimes it's the other way around. The kids are coming to church and the parents are sleeping in. All right, but what happens? And in one day, it'll be too late because your kid is now an adult. And they don't have to listen to you anymore. They only have to honor you. They don't have to listen to you. All right? And it'll be too late. And all the years of praying for the kids, and all the years of trying to reasoning for the kids, and all the years of trying to get your kids to come to church are now wasted, and they're on a spiritual death. All right? One day it will be too late. All right? The only cure for your child is Jesus Christ. They may leave Jesus in the church, but we as parents should never give up on them. Look at Jairus' daughter. She grew up in the synagogue. She was the daughter of one of Israel's rulers. She was probably in the kids' program, in the Sunday school, and an active. And she died. And she was dead. Until who showed up? Jesus showed up. Right, there's a generation of church kids today that are dying spiritually. They reject the things of God. And just like the man with the palsy whose friends had faith and brought him, Jairus had faith in and of himself to say, Lord, heal my daughter. He called on the master to heal her. Even though she was dead, he just said, Lord, just put your hand on her, and I know you can bring my daughter back to life. That takes some faith. A lot of times people quit, but not this man. He loved his daughter. All right, let's go to verse 23. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house, he saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. But minstrels, <laughs> that's an old word. Oh, little kind of girls, you know, popping around. Right? And people making a noise. And he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. They said, Jesus said, Hey, she's just sleeping. They're like, Jesus... You're wrong, buddy. You, you may have done some things good in the past, but she's dead. All right? But when, well, verse 25, but when the people were put forth, he went and took her by the hand, and the maid arose, and the fame thereof went abroad into all the land. All the Lord did was just walk in, grab her hand, and poof, she's alive. And his fame, people started saying, this man, Jesus, brings people back from the dead. Parents, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and winning your kid's soul for God should always be a priority in your life. Always, if your kids are hurt, bring the Lord to them. If they won't go to the Lord, you bring the Lord to them. The third person we see here, the third situation, which is kind of, you know, five people, you got to run through them quick here. The third person in the third situation we have here is the woman here uh, at verses 20 uh, to 22. She had an issue of blood, verse 20. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood, 12 years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Here this woman had an issue of blood. And without getting too graphic, we, we're all adults, we kind of know where, you know where the blood was coming from. All right, and she had a blood flow issue. 
If you want to read a lot about this, the Old Testament has a lot to say about this in the book of Leviticus, chapter 15. A woman who had an issue of blood was not even allowed in the temple. All right. Luke tells us here the parallel passage here in Luke chapter 8, verse 43. Uh, and the woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. Luke gives us a little more information. You see, they didn't have, you know, health insurance back in Bible days. You wanted to go to a doctor, you had to pay the doctor. And for 12 years, this woman spent all the money she had trying to solve her issue of blood. And the doctors could not cure her. And according to Leviticus chapter 15, she was unclean. She was not even allowed in the temple. She was not allowed to participate in the things of God. But she says here in verse 21, but she said to herself, I've got to see God. Verse 21, for she said within herself, if I may touch his garment, I shall be whole. Here we have another person with faith. All Jairus' faith, hey, I know the Lord. All you got to do is just come and I know you can raise my daughter from the dead. This woman with the issue of blood, all I need to do is just touch a little, a little teeny piece of the Lord's coat and I'm going to be healed. That takes some faith. That's another thing you see on TV with these TV preachers. You know, you buy the holy towels and the holy water and this and that. I mean, you know, I, I, I say don't do it. Just go to the Lord. Touch his garment. All right? He healed the woman who was not allowed in the temple. And by comparison, Jesus healed the young girl earlier who had spent her whole life in the temple. He's now healing a woman who for 12 years was not allowed to go into the temple. Isn't that interesting? Two comparisons. And he healed the woman who was not allowed in the temple. Verse 22, and, but Jesus turned him about. And when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And let me tell you something. You're here today. You want to be healed? Our Lord and Savior Jesus, he can heal you. Jesus can help anyone. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be healed. That's our, that's our faith. Whosoever is anyone. You have a problem. You have an issue. Who said, well, Lord, I call upon you. Heal me. Help me. Save me. That's available. Fourthly, we have the blind men here in verses 27 to 31. The blind men. All right, verse 27. And when Jesus departed, that's, you know, it's kind of like Jesus bopping around. He just walks into, you know, this, this you know, sick part. Then he walks into the, 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 the dead door. And then you know, chapter 9, some interesting things going on. And verse 27, and when Jesus departed, thence two blind men followed him, crying, saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. It's faith. Why can't people see today? Because today they're spiritually blind. Just like the blind men were physically blind in, in, in Jesus' day, we have a generation of people that are spiritually blind. They can't see the things of God. It could be right in front of their face and they can't even see it. And what's the difference? Is that these blind men have faith. Why can't they see what God has done uh, for them in this world today? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Who's the God of this world? You notice it's God in a small, you know, small G, it's not capital. The God of this world is Satan. And Satan has blinded this world. In whom the small God, G-O-D, of this world hath blinded the minds of them. All of the sins, the nonsense, all of the... It just blinds people. They have pleasure, they have fun, but they're blinded. Satan has blinded this world, and the world doesn't believe on Jesus Christ. 
Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 40, He had blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that should not see with their eyes, not understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Jesus says it's not only blinded with their eyes, but with their heart. Oh boy, don't we have a cold-hearted society now? All right? Just walk downtown Portland on, on any given night. Go, go downtown Brooklyn on any given night. That people, are, they're blinded. And what Jesus says here is that he wants to give you spiritual light. Jesus asked for the blind men in verse 28, and the blind men's faith kicks in in verse 29, and in verse 30, Jesus heals them. Do you believe that God can heal and save anybody today? I believe that. Absolutely. All right. Verse 29, And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then he touched he, 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 his, their eyes, saying, According to your faith, there's an old faith kicking in again, right? be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they didn't listen to the Lord. But verse 31, when they departed, spread abroad his fame in all the country. And this man, Jesus, he raises people from the dead. I was blind, but now I can see. He heals the blinded. And there's a lot of people in the world that are blind. And we have the great physician, Jesus. Oh, boy. I mean, I have reading glasses, okay? And you know, many guys know that it was my birthday on Friday. But... It was also my driver's license expired. I know, pandemic, you know, killer hornets, the hurricane. That meant I had to go to the eye doctor. And I'm like, I had 2015 vision. I mean, I could see, drive, and I had to do, I had to do the eye exam. And if you go to the eye doctor and say, put your hand over your right eye, read, read the letters. I'm like, where's the letters? <laughs> I'm like, then she, oh, all right, all right, uh, oh. D, O, D, boy, there's a lot of O's and D's. Oh boy, Superman, let's do the right eye. The minimum standards for New York State is 2040. I got 2040, I just passed. And the doctor says, you need glasses. And my wife and kids, they've worn glasses their whole lives. I know how expensive they are. These are the dollar, you know, the, the, the drugstore reading glasses. I'm not going into the, the, the eyes. Oh, yeah, Mr. Aaron, you need that nice gold frame, 700. No, I don't. I'll turn it off. Mr. Magoo, it's okay. Oh, boy, but we got a generation of blind people, and the devil has blinded them. All right? And then fifthly here, look at verses 32 and 33. We have the dumb man possessed with the devil. Uh, he was not dumb because he couldn't add two and two. He was dumb because he was possessed by the devil. Look at verse 32. And they went out. Behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. Yeah, what, a, what an interesting day in the life of Jesus. Raising people from the dead. Healing, healing a woman with the issue. Uh, healing some blind men. All right, now we got a devil possessed. But boy, that, you talk about a day. All right? And the Pharisees, um, and, when the devil, and when the Pharisees said, he casteth out devils through the prince of devils. They're saying, the only reason why the Lord could do this is because he was a devil himself. Oh boy, wait till these Pharisees meet, meet Jesus in heaven. They're going to wish they never said that. Verse 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. I right, look at the, uh, uh, verse 32. We see the they. Again, it's the they. It is, it is people bringing a lost, dumb, unsafe person to the Lord. All right? And this is what we need to be doing, church. We need to be inviting our lost friends. Now, you don't want to say, hey, you're dumb. Would you like to come to my church? That's not going to work, okay? you got to say, hey, we have free pizza and free cans of Coke and Dunkin' Donuts. And, hey, you're going to have a nice time. And, you know, you know that they're spiritually dumb. You don't tell them that, okay? Hey, we were all dumb one, at one time. Amen. All right? Some of us were a lot dumber than, <laughs> than, what, we, than what we really but we see that they bring in someone to Jesus. 
Why is the man dumb? Because the devil had possessed him and made him dumb. And what did Jesus do? He cast the devil out. Not only will the devil blind you, but he'll also possess you. Isn't that interesting? Because the devil does not want to see anyone made in the image of God to go to heaven. It is his mission to bring everyone down because he knows he's going down and he's vindictive and he's going to possess you and he's going to blind you. But the they, you see, church, we're the they. We have the power to defeat the devil because we have Jesus. Jesus always wins. And what did Jesus do? He cast the devil out. And when you get saved, and now the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is inside you. That's what happened. It's goodbye, devil. And hello, Holy Spirit. Yes, I'm saved. Yes, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Yeah. We're not dumb anymore. We're smart. We're happy. We're joyful. Why? Because we have the Holy Ghost of God. We have the healing power of Jesus. We have the Father in heaven that loves us. It doesn't get any better than that. And when the devil was cast out, verse 33, the dumb spake. And remember, when you got saved, you told people about Jesus. Right? You spoke. You spoke about how Jesus forgave you of your sins. You spoke on how God loves you. And when you get healed by Jesus, you'll start talking Bible smart, not devil dumb. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Goodbye, devil. Goodbye, bad stuff. Goodbye, issue of blood. Goodbye, death. Behold, all things are new. New life, new house in heaven, new eternity, new forever. I'm... I'm hot. See, you guys have the air conditioner. I need like an air conditioner like blowing on me. Don't stand next. I can even smell my stuff. <laughs> but therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, notice in this chapter, we have our buddies here, the Pharisees, stirring up the pot. And you know Jesus had three enemies to deal with in his earthly ministry. He had the Pharisees, he had the Sadducees, and the Herodians. Right? The Pharisees would be your modern ritualistic types. They reject the blood atonement outwardly, even though the Bible says it's the blood of Jesus that washed away my sins. Right? The example of the Pharisees uh, would be like the Catholic Church or the Episcopalian Church, where everything is formal, ritual, robes, and this and that, but there's no, there's no love for Jesus. That's why the Catholic Church does blood sacrifices every week when we already had the death of Jesus on the cross those thousands of years ago. The Sadducees, they were the liberals. They didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. Right? The Sadducees were Bible haters. They were correctors, Bible correctors. They were rationalists. They reject the Bible as God's perfect, inspired, preserved word of God. Right? A lot of modern Bible schools are, are like these Sadducees. All right. Now it's funny, but back in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were enemies. But when Jesus came along, they formed a little, a little union against the Lord. They were the ones that teamed up together and plotted the Lord's death. Now the, now the Herodians, all right, these are your broad-minded folks, no standards, humanism, all right. Uh, they would even consider uh, my preaching as heat speech. Right? They would say things like, there's many paths to God. Don't judge me. Man is the measure of all things. That's not politically correct. All right? So the, the Lord had to deal with all different types of critics. Now going back to Matthew here, chapter 9, verse 32. And they went out, and behold, they brought him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitude marveled, saying it was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said he cast out devils to the Prince of Peace. And Jesus went uh, about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Uh, Jesus here just spent an entire chapter in one town, in one day, uh, healing the man with the palsy, uh, raising Jairus' daughter uh, from the dead. You have the woman who was diseased with an issue of blood. He healed the two blind men, and he 
cast out the devil and save the dumb man. And this is our world. They have no control over their bodies. They're weak in sin. They're spiritually dead. They're unclean. They're blind. They're dumb. And they're possessed by the devil, the God of this world. And what are we to do? Again, we ought to be the they. We ought to bring them to Jesus. And when we have faith and then they have faith, God kicks in and can do a, a healing miracle in their lives. It's our job to bring them to Jesus so Jesus can heal and save them. So they can become born again. They can have eternal life. They can have a relationship with God. They can have brothers and sisters here on earth. And thank God we have the good shepherd who cares for us and heals us and gives us our sight and makes us clean and makes us smart and brings us back to life and gives us eternal life. And that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he healed them all. Amen. Amen. All right, that's the message. A little, a little shorty today. 30 minutes. I feel like I cheated. I, 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 I'll read some more notes. Amen. Five people who the Lord dealt with, and I'm sure each and every one of us deals with one or two of these spiritually type of people every week in our lives, and we are the day we bring them to Jesus. Amen? All right. Let's see. Uh, you guys want to sing a closing hymn? Well, what does it pray? I want to sing happy birthday. Happy That's Friday. Well, All right, you want to sing it for me? I mean, okay. I mean, you know. I want to sing happy birthday. You want to sing happy birthday? All right. You, you, go ahead. to serve you guys and minister unto you all. Uh, we're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And uh, uh, we've all had, I can relate myself to one of these five guys, but once I'm in here on Sunday morning and I see you guys, I get all excited and I'm just here for God. And I know you guys are here as well. So brother, why don't you uh, close with a prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the Heavenly Father, we thank you.